Alexander Henderson was one of the Scottish commissioners to the Westminster Assembly. And this sermon is by him, and it's on the text of Philippians 4, six and, verses 6 and 7. And that text says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Alexander Henderson. It is a matter, beloved, that it is that is very comfortable for us to have this peace and this liberty to assemble ourselves thus publicly in the house of God, all of us together, for serving of the Lord our God and for advancing the salvation of our own souls. And when the Lord gives unto us such a fair hour of the day of his gracious visitation in such a tempestuous time as this is, we had need to take notice of it and to learn to make the right use of it. Even as you know, people used to do when there is a reason, un, unseasonable harvest time, whenever they can have a fair hour in it, they cut down their corns and gather them together. And yet, albeit that this sort of peace be a very comfortable thing to have such a peace at, this, at such a time, Yet, it is exceeding far more comfortable for us to have our souls filled with that peace, which is spoken of in, in this text, which now we have read unto you. And this peace, when we would have it, we must still come to Christ and get it through Him. And that peace which is gotten through Christ is that peace which passes understanding. And if we had it, we should be guarded and kept by it in our hearts and in our minds against all these fears and discouragements wherewith our souls are compassed about, as by so many enemies. And we must of necessity be overcome by them unless we be guarded by such a strong guard as this peace of God is. Surely, beloved, this is the very thing that of all things we stand in greatest need of at such a time as this. And it is the thing that can keep us best in all troubles. And it is attained by these means that are not, that now we are about of the word and of the sacraments. This is the thing that the Lord does promise unto us. And we are to expect it from God through Jesus Christ. When we use the means according to his direction and warrant set down to us in his word and a special help and a mean whereby we may get this peace of God that passes understanding is to be solicitous nor careful about nothing. What the success thereof shall be, but in everything but by prayer and supplications, let our requests be made known to God. Let us not trouble ourselves with anything, but only have a care of doing our duty, whether it be for the preparation of anything that ought to be prepared, or if it be for the communication of anything to us, whether it be in matters of the world or in such matters as this that now we are about. What the event and success of them shall be, let us leave that to the Lord. And if so be that we perform that duty which is required of us and leave the success to the Lord, then this peace of God, it shall always serve for this end to be a strong guard unto us. Now for the exhortation itself. It consists in three things. First, what it is that we are forbidden to do. Be careful for nothing. Second, what it is that we are commanded to do. In everything, by supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And third, there is something that is promised here, which is the most rare and excellent jewel and the richest treasure that ever yet was heard of and does farthest pass our capacity and understanding the peace of God for the world we may compass with our wits and our understandings but we cannot do so with this peace of God for it passes all understanding and if so be that we get this peace of God it shall be a strong guard to us against all our enemies both outwardly and inwardly and all this we have through Jesus Christ and so we have contained in the words 
what it is that we should not do, what it is that we should do, and what shall be the event of all that we do if we do it after the right manner. We have many enemies to encounter in our way, and therefore we must be careful in everything. But we must not be careful about the event, but only to let our requests be made known to God by supplications with thanksgiving. And doing so, we need not to trouble ourselves about the event, but be secure concerning that, having this peace of God through Jesus Christ. But let us now go on in order with the words as they lie in the text. First, careful. The word that is here translated careful as it is in the original language is sometimes taken in a good part as it is in verse 20, chapter 2 of the same epistle. The holy apostle says, Therefore I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your estate, which is the same very word that is used in this place. And indeed it is no marvel notwithstanding the nature thereof be taken in a good part. Because there is no man who has a care to do his duty, but his mind always does agitate the matter, and, be, and there is two sides there, and the one of them does always dispute against the other, and then when they have disputed the matter, whatsoever they think both, both to be best, they conclude upon that, and that they will do it. And when it is so, there cannot but be a disputing between the one part and the other, and where there is a disputing, there cannot but be a division, and so a care to choose that which is best and to do it. And yet, nevertheless, the word more ordinarily is taken in an ill part to signify an unlawful care. And for this cause, the late translators of the Bible, they have done very wisely in translating this word both these ways, that when the word is taken in a good sense, they translate it after the word care, and when the word is taken in an ill sense, they translate it carefulness. Because when it is so, to be careful carkingly, it fills the heart full of care, and it rests not in doing the duty. But those who have it, they are troubled, and have a carefulness to know what shall be the events of that which they do. Now, if you will consider of them, there is a very great difference between the one and the other. For the duty of care, it is commanded of God to care for everything, and it is also commendable so to do. But for this carefulness, it is expressly forbidden of God, and it is a thing that is altogether unlawful. This lawful care, it is only a providence and a foresight to prevent some things, and to get some things done so far as we can, looking always to God's providence to overrule. But this carefulness... It is a diffidence and distrust of God's providence towards us. Again, this lawful care, it fills the head with thoughts to choose that which is best and likeliest and to do our duty in it. But for carefulness, it falls in upon the heart and oppresses it and makes it to sink and to pine in grief and sorrow, for it can never see the end of anything but it shall be. This lawful care, it contents itself with doing the duty in anything. It rests there. But for this unlawful carefulness, it does not so. It cannot content itself with doing the duty. But it would evermore be farther. It troubles itself about the success and event, what that shall be. Now, you may see the odds between the one and the other is very great. For the one is commanded of God and is lawful. It is only a providence and a foresight of things that makes them who have it to think upon doing their duty, and it rests there. But for this carking carefulness, it is altogether unlawful and forbidden of God. It is a distrusting of God's providence, and it cannot rest in the head, but it falls in upon the heart and troubles and vexes it, even like to those furies or like the burning of the fire of hell. And it cannot content itself to rest upon the doing of a duty about anything, but it would always be at that to know what shall be the success and event of everything. Beloved, this is a thing that is natural to men, not to keep a, a mid-course in things, but either to be in this extremity that they care none at all, or otherwise if they take them to care when their hearts are filled with unlawful carefulness. 
while we are at peace and prosperity and all things that we that weigh are well with us, then we have no care at all. And then when any affliction or trouble comes upon us, then our hearts are so full of carefulness that we wot not what course to take, that we may be freed of it. Beloved, I may say that these many years past ye have lying in security, and ye have made a covenant with hell, with death, and with the grave. But I think that ye have not considered the work of the Lord as ye should have done, for if so be that ye had looked to it aright, ye might have seen the Lord punishing that covenant ye had made at that time and punishing you for the breach of that covenant that formerly ye had made with the Lord. And indeed, as I told you before, ye departed, but over soon and over easily from your former covenant with the Lord and from purity of religion. But now ye are entered in a renewed covenant with him again, and I wish from my heart that many of you who have done it have not done it for the fashion and for the company's cause, because many of the rest of the kingdom have done it, or for some worldly respect. And now, upon the other side, I wish that your carefulness grow not as great as your carelessness was before. And so you be driven from one side to the other between two extremities. Now there is a threefold care that we of this land are careful about at this time. First, there is a national care. What shall become of this whole nation? Whether we shall have peace or if we shall have war in it. Whether we shall attain to our liberties, both religious and civil. And if we shall get religion established in the land and purity thereof. And indeed, if so be that we return to our former estate, wherein once we were, then we shall be the most slavish people every way that ever was heard of under the, the scope of heaven. We shall be in a greater slavery than the people of Israel were when they were under the Egyptian slavery. The second care of this land is, it is a, a domestic care. Noblemen caring what shall become of their houses and rents. Barons and gentlemen thinking what shall become of their houses and their estate. And burgesses thinking what shall become of our burgs and of our houses and of our ventures. If so be that we shall stand out against human authority for the cause of divine authority and in obedience to divine authority, we obey not them in human authority. And we are caring for this. What if prelates shall return to this land again? Once ye of this city were in carelessness about this, I, ye prided yourselves in this, that ye had the great primate and metropolitan of Scotland, and your city was called the metropolitan city. That ye had the great chancellor of Scotland to stay in your, in your city. And now you have a carefulness about it. You think that if ye shall... If he shall return in all his former pomp and grandeur and come in violence against you, must ye not then all crouch under him? And what if your pastors, who have, ha who have at this time deserted you, that they would not uh, preach to you? What if they shall return to their places again? How shall they rail against you most despitefully? Now, all these is to trouble yourselves about the event of things. The third sort of care is a personal care, such as ye of this congregation have, and all these who are come here at this time to receive some comfort from the Lord. They will say, I am not come here now to the use of means, but I wot not what I shall get for my coming. I wot not whether I will profit anything or not. But I say for all these cares, whether national or domestic or personal, whatever your care be, do ye these duties that the Lord commands to be done by you and remit the success and the event of all to God. There are so many thoughts that meet together in our heads at once, like a number of contrary winds ready to swallow us up or like a deluge ready to drown us. But there is no remedy for all these albeit we were presently encompassed about with an army, but only for us to do our duty and to remit the success and the event of all to God. And I will show unto you two or three reasons wherefore you should do this. First, because our carefulness 
about the success and event of anything is to take God's prerogative from him. The first Peter, the apostle says, cast all your care upon God, for he careth for you. There we have a commandment to cast all our care upon God, and we have a promise annexed to it that he will care for us. And so it is a suitable thing for us to do. In Psalm 37, verse 5, David says, Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. That is, roll over all your ways or affairs upon the Lord. What is that, to roll over all your ways upon the Lord? The meaning is this. I find a great burden of cares all convening together in me, which makes up a law, unlawful carefulness and makes me to neglect the doing of my duty and only to look to the success what it shall be. Now I see that I cannot bear this burden and therefore I take it and it rolls off myself over upon the Lord and henceforth I will trouble myself with it no more but only do my duty and not look to the success what it shall be. This is to put our trust in the Lord and when we do so then we may be sure because he has so promised to us that he will bring the matter to pass. It is not possible for us to bear such a burden and to think upon the success of anything. And then it is God's prerogative that belongs to him. And so, in troubling ourselves about the success of anything, we do two wrongs. We take, first, we take on a burden about, upon our own back, which we are not able to bear and so wrong ourselves. And second, the Lord has taken the success of everything to be his own prerogative. And therefore, in so doing, we rob God of that which is his due. And shall we especially, who have had such experiences of the goodness of God in former times, begin to trouble ourselves about the success of things now? Who was it that did, first of all, think upon us to bring us to life and brought us out at such a time when the light of the gospel is clearly preached and has so long and constantly provided for us sent his Son to the world to die for us, and especially to look unto that, that he has begun so fair and so glorious a work among us, and has already brought it so far on, shall we now begin to cast doubts about the success thereof? No, no, let us not do so, but let us pursue and go on the uttermost in doing our duty, and we shall find the success in the end to be sweet and comfortable. Shall we then sacrilegiously rob God of that which is his prerogative and due and take the thing upon ourselves which we are not able to do? A second reason wherefore we should not trouble ourselves about the success of matters is this. What will all our carefulness do? It will help us nothing at all as you have heard today already. Except the Lord build the house, he that builds there buildeth in vain. Except the Lord watch the city, he that watches watches in vain. It is in vain for us to rise up early, to lie down late, and to eat the bread of sorrow all the day long, except the Lord give the blessing to our labors. And indeed, if when we are doing our duty, we look only to the success and care for it, we can have but little comfort in it. Can any of you, by your carefulness, as our Master says, add one cubit to his stature, or change one hair from white to black, now, if ye by your care cannot do these things which are so little, how can you do anything in these things the doing thereof belongs only to God? And so take not the care of success and event from God, for then you will be as orphans and fatherless children who has nobody to care for them but themselves, and so are ill cared for, yea, neglected. And seeing he has given this word, his word past his promise, and pledged his truth to care for us, and yet we do not lay our burdens over upon him, it is well deserved that he should lay them over upon ourselves and break our back with them, and yet the success to be but bad when all is done. And therefore let not carefulness about anything oppress us, especially carefulness about the world. Neither let us for any care or fear of this kind depart from the smallest thing that is in our covenant. For if ye lose but one dram weight of God's glory and honor, ye shall not miss to lose a whole stone weight of your own with it. <clears throat> Remember, 
but of Haman's policy, that he used to establish himself and his, his after him and to attain to respect and honor. He thought that the meanest way to do so was to have all the Jews throughout the king's provinces cut off. And yet, that same thing was the very mean of his utter ruin and decay. And remember also of Jeroboam's policy that he used to get his kingdom and his throne established forever? He thought he would not have the people of the ten tribes going to Jerusalem as they were wont to do for fear that they should be allured some way to join themselves to the old kingdom of Judah again. And therefore he would erect two calves, one at Dan, another at Bethel, that the people of the ten tribes might worship there. And then he thought he was sure enough when he had done so. And yet that same was the very mean of taking the kingdom from him and from all his posterity after him. And remember also the policy of the Pharisees and elders of Israel in our Savior's days. They say, if we hearken unto him and believe in him, then the Romans, they will come upon us, and they will take our nation and our city from us. And yet their not hearing of him and believing in him was the cause, wherefore the Lord made the Romans to come upon them to destroy them. And so men, by their policies and devices that they use, Contrary to the commandment of God, they are twining and twisting so many ropes to hang themselves. And when men begin to fight against God, he can take their own sword and sheath it into their own side. And so when thou thinkst that thou art establishing thyself by some sinful course, he will turn it upon thyself and disappoint thee of thy purpose. I will only give you but one example of this, and it is written in Second Kings 10. Ahab, he was a very wicked man and sold himself to work wickedness. And yet, he resolves that he would have his kingdom and throne established, whether God would or not. The prophet Elijah is sent to him to tell him that the kingdom should not be established in his seed, to tell him that none of his posterity should reign after him. And in very familiar terms, he tells it that there should not be left of his seed so much as one that pisseth against the wall. Now, this wicked man thought it, that it should be so, albeit God had said it. And therefore, he takes to himself many wives and begets many sons, even the number of three score and ten. He commits the keeping of them to seventy princes of Israel, and they were all kept within the strong walled city of Samaria. So he thought that they were sure enough, and yet Jehu, he rises up, and causes these same princes who had them in keeping to take all their heads off of them in one day and bring them and lay them down before the gate of Jezreel. Men may resolve that they will make themselves and their generations to be great men and to stand sure in the earth. Yet the Lord, he can take a besom and sweep them clean away so that there shall be no memory of them except it be a remembrance of ignominy and shame. Those who knew them or had anything to do with them, they shall be ashamed of them when they hear of them. So let us learn to be careful in nothing carkingly. Second, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Objection, then shall we be careful for nothing? Shall we take no care at all? No carking care but only let us do our duty, what it, God has commanded us to do. And when we, sh we do so, it is not carefulness, but let us remit the success of all things to God. And let us present our supplication to God in prayer, adding with all thanksgiving. Here we have three things to be considered of. First, there is the duty itself. Second, the extent of this duty. And third, the end, wherefore it is done. For the duty is prayer, and supplications with thanksgiving, the extent of it is in everything. The end is that by these, your requests may be made known to God. Now, the first, for, first of all, for the duty, you see that there are three words in it, prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. And you will see in 1 Timothy 2, 5, that there is another join to these three, to wit, intercession. And so there are four of them. 
upon which place it is that the papists buildeth their mass, and they allege that they have for their warrant of their exposition of it that way, the 59th epistle of Augustine, written to him by Paulinus. And they say that according to that same order that he sets down there in his epistle uh, and is used in 1 Timothy 2, is the sacrifice of the Mass done. For first of all, they have it in obsecration, which we call supplication, and this done before the consecration of the elements. And second, there is prayer, and this is used of the very time of consecration. And afterwards also when the priest says, Ademus deser Peter Noster. Third, there is postulations used in it, which we call intercessions. Four, there is thanksgiving used in it for bestowing upon the receivers the real presence of the body and blood of Christ. And even according to this order, some men in this land have taken upon them to defend our service book and the prayers that are used in it. And so what the papists have taken to defend their mass, some of our clergymen have taken to the same to defend the service book. And indeed, just reason have they to, so to do, for there is not two things can be liker others than these two are, the one to be in English and the other to be in Latin. And indeed, if our service book be rightly examined, it will be found to be nothing else but directly an English mass. But indeed, this of the papists is very ill-reasoned from Augustine. It is true indeed. He speaks of all these four sorts of prayers, but he speaks not a word at all of a mass in that place or any other, nor of a sacrifice for the sins of the quick and the dead, nor of oblation, nor of adoration. No, no, these were only set down by him because of the ignorance of these who lived in these days. But there is not so much as the appearance of a word of a mass in them. And there is also a, a sweet meditation of Bernard, Equator, Modus, Orandi. It is true, it is sweet like indeed. But how sound it is, I leave that to yourselves to be judged by you. For I will not stay to speak of it now. He says we are hindered to pray two ways. One is we are hindered to pray when our light is not great. Again, we are hindered when our light is over great. When we have no light, then we are hindered to pray to God because we see not our sins. And when we have over great light, we are also hindered to pray to God because then we see our sins to be so many and so great that we dare not. Therefore, is it that our light, it must be tempered unto us and that, that we have either neither too great light nor too small light. And when we have such an indifferent light as that, then it is that we are rightly put to pray. And at the very first, he says, we come to that which he calls veracundu affectu. The sinner dare not pray for himself, but he desires that another may pray for him. And for example of this, he brings in the example of that woman who had the bloody issue, who durst not come near to the Christ, but only touched the hem of his garment. The second degree that we come is from that which he calls puro affectu, and he bringeth an example of this from that woman who did wash Christ's feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. She came near to Christ, but she held herself very low. The third degree the sinner comes to, it is from a more ample and large affection, when the sinner dare not pray for him themselves, but they dare also to pray for others, as the woman of Canaan did who besought Christ for her daughter. The fourth degree they come to is from devotu affectu, as he calls it, and for this, he brings in the example of Lazarus. When Jesus raised him from the dead, it is said that first he wept, and then before he was risen, Jesus lifteth up his eyes and says, Father, I thank thee that thou heardest me. <clears throat> As I told you, this is very sweet-like, but the solidity of it is not to be dependent on. It is not, it's like a thing that is very sweet or beautiful-like, but has no substance with it. And therefore, we must not ground our faith upon such conceits as these, albeit for the most part it has been counted the learning of this generation wherein we live. And indeed, I think if a man might surely ground upon these, he might soon come to that to cite enough of them. No, I think there be no ground for, at all for it to say that these four be four diverse sorts of prayers, 
that supplications be made for removing of ills imminent or incumbent, that prayer is for supplying of good things that we would have, that intercession is when we intercede for others, and that thanksgiving is when we offer praises and thanksgiving to God for hearing us in these. But the meaning of all these is to express the nature of prayer unto us that we may learn when we are once begun in it to pray for all these so that when we fall upon such a ground as that, it is best for us to keep ourselves by it. The thing that we are to learn here is that the best way for us to disburden ourselves of our carefulness about the success of anything and to roll the matter over upon God is to pray to God and with prayer to join thanksgiving. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. According to that, Psalm 50, Call upon me in the day of thy trouble. I will answer thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Thou knowest that it is God who hears prayers. And thou prayest to him, and when thou sayest, I have prayed to God, and he has heard me, and therefore I will glorify him, for by that thou knowest that he is not a dumb or deaf idol, for I know that he both sees and hears. And indeed, this is a strong second to faith when the Lord is pleased to deal so. And when it is so, that thou hast prayed to God according to his word, and he hears thee, then it is not possible, but thou must praise him. And therefore in the psalm, the name of the Lord is called a strong tower. Most unhappy are these men who cannot disburden their cares upon the Lord. And when God is beginning to work anything wherefore thou ought to care, then he is calling thee to pray to him. And so to cast the burden off of yourselves upon himself. And indeed, it would be a comfortable way for us, if so be, that we could learn to do so. It is a pitiful thing to see men worn out in sorrow and in the depths of affliction, and not to know so much as that there is a God to pray to, or that he is calling them thereby to pray to him. I know the natural man, when he is in this case, he has no mind at all to pray. But the child of God should not do so. And therefore, let us learn always to come to God and to make him our resting place. Let him be the breath of our nostrils and let us all, always lift up our faces toward heaven to him, for he is our king, our Lord, and our husband. And if we cast our care upon him, he will care for us. Yea, he must care for us. If we rely upon him, for he is bound to do so. And surely... We wot not what course to take. When we wot not what course to take, nor what to do, but we shall see all to be against us, then let us send up that winged messenger of prayer to heaven. And it shall not miss, but it shall bring help to us. And so when the saints and the children of God are at an extremity at what they, that they wot not what to do, but outwardly they are enclosed by enemies on all sides, then faith comes in by the word of God and says, I see you are in an extremity that ye know not what to do. Ye can see no way how to get anything in you, into you, nor how to get a messenger sent out from you. Nor have ye any who will hazard to go for you. Yet I know of a winged messenger who has a way to win upward to God, and he will help. And indeed, albeit St. Andrews were presently enclosed about with companies of men so that we could see no way to send a messenger to get relief and support to us, yet we would find this winged messenger of prayer ready to go up for us and to fly to heaven's gates and rap and knock there, and it would win in through the mediator, Jesus, the Lord of hosts and armies, of whom ye heard this day. And if we could use this messenger aright, he could soon send down help and supply for us. Now for this prayer, there is a necessity in three respects that thanksgiving be joined with prayer. First, when we are praying to God, we must thank him for what favors we have received already from him. And there is none but they know that they are bound to thank him for these. And secondly, we must also thank him for favors presently received. For of necessity there must be a conjunction of these two. For that is certain. He who sets himself up to pray in spirit before ye have done 
with prayer. He will find matter of thanksgiving to God for some favor at that time received. Ye may see the example of this to be clear in David. Throughout many of his psalms, he begins them with many heavy and sad complaints, but you will see again that he endeth many of them with joy, praises, and thanksgiving to God. And this was not for anything that he had formerly received from God, but for something received by him at the same time. And we should also thank him, at least promise thanksgiving to him for the benefits that we are to receive. Lord, if we be not foolish, who will not promise to be thankful to the Lord for his favors when we crave them of him? We have no other rhetoric to move the Lord to grant anything to us, but only to promise to be th- to him to be thankful for it when we have gotten it. And so thanksgiving and prayer are joined together in all these three respects. And surely, whoever they be who come to pray to God and thank him not for his bygone favors, It is a token that we are altogether unfit and unprepared for prayer when we give not thanks to God, neither for favors bestowed upon ourselves nor upon others. Secondly, when we pray to God and it is not joined with thanksgiving for present favors, it is a token that our prayers are only but lip labor. And when we pray to God and do not promise to be thankful to him for afterwards, then it is a token that our prayers are nothing else but hypocrisy. For if we could do otherwise, it is a token that we would not come to God for it. And therefore, if so be that thou be praying to God for a good success, either to thine own particular adieus, or for the matter of thy salvation, or for success to this sacrament, or are praying for a blessing to this church and kingdom, let it still be joined with thanksgiving. And ye of the city, ye have reason to do this, both to pray and to be thankful to God, to humble yourselves and to pray to God to pardon you your sins in falling from his truth, and to praise him for that he has begun to make his light to shine among you again, and be thankful to him that he has granted you any sorrow of heart for your sins, and given you matter of joy in returning the purity of his word, of his worship, in any measure among you. Evermore, when you pray for anything to the Lord, resolve evermore this far, at least, if so be he give it, I will be thankful for it, especially if it be for a matter of grace, either for thyself or for the kirk. Second, now ye be remembered. There were two words, two other words I promised to speak to you. The extent of this duty of prayer in everything. Before ye heard... <coughs> He said, be careful for nothing. Now he says, in everything, let your requests be made known to God. The one of these is contrary to the other. The one speaks of nothing, the other of everything. And so you see that the one is of as large an extent as the other. Christ will have the smallest thing to be cared for by us, but only with this caveat. He will have us to know that it is he principally who cares for it to us. And he will have us to show our care by praying to him for it. If it be a great matter that thou stands in need of, then recommend the matter to God and resolve that thou wilt wait upon him for this success thereof. I will only do my duty that the Lord requires of me to do. Yea, I will not leave off doing my duty till it be done and resolve to do so in the smallest matters also. Luther had never won to such a reformation as he won to if he had not laid that ground and he uttered speeches to that same purpose. Some thought them to be a, have been utterly uttered rashly and unadvisedly, but he spake them in confidence and boldly. He said at one time, The Pope shall sooner be converted and turned from his ways than I shall quit this. And if it be in small matters that thou hast ado, as I think the strongest and the greatest wit that is upon earth will find the smallest matter to trouble him mightily if he cares for the, the success thereof himself, And when thou art troubled about the success thereof, think that it is a direct calling upon thee to recommend the matter to him by prayer. Then go to thy cabinet and recommend the matter to him there. Or go to the house of God and lay it out with the people of God there. Do thou thy duty in it and recommend the success thereof to God. And thus thou shalt find the peace of God possessing thy soul. Oh, if we knew this, what a communion there is between God and God 
and the Christian soul. They cry to him, Abba, Father, my Father. The barren will not cry after, after to the mother or father when it would have anything from them or when anything aileth them, nor we should see a continual necessity laid upon us of ele- elevation of our souls to God in prayer. But especially, beloved, we would be exceeding earnest with him in this great matter of the Kirk of Christ in this land. We would be continually making our requests known to God concerning it. And therefore we are exhorted by the prophets to give the Lord rest neither day nor night till he establish Jerusalem and make it the praise of the earth again. And howso, howsoever your prayers have been in time bygone, <clears throat> whether ye have been slack in them or if ye have been fervent in them, yet now be fervent and constant in prayer, day and night, and give the Lord no rest till his Zion be established and made the beauty of this land. And Isaiah 51, Awake, awake, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. And then after that, he goes on promising mercy to them if they will call for it. Isaiah 63, they say, Doubtless thou art our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not. Doubtless, O Lord, thou art our father, so that albeit all should forget us, yet we may have recourse to God and seek help from him. Jeremiah 14, the prophet says, O Lord, Though our iniquities testify against us, do thou it for thy name's sake. And so he goes sweetly in confessing their faults and praying to God. So that if we be acquainted with the word of God, we may learn by it that we may have our recourse to him by prayer in everything. But especially in matters of the Kirk, we ought to be most earnest with him in prayer for that. Now the end wherefore this should be done is that your requests may be made known to God. Question, does not the Lord know what our, re- our requests are before we present to the, him, them to him in prayer? The answer, yes, he knows them as well before as he knows them after. For this is the difference between these supplications that we put up to God and these that we put up to men. For when we present a supplication for anything to men, we present it for that end to make our request known to them, because they know it not before or at least they know it not perfectly, and we do it to move them to grant our requests. But it is not so with God, for neither can we inform him any better concerning our estate than he is already, nor can we move him to grant us anything which before he did not intend to give us. But the scripture speaks so of God because the Lord has ordained us to use this mean of supplicating and praying to him, even as if we were to inform him of our case, or to move him to grant anything to us, and we should be as careful and as solicitous in prayer as if it were so. That which we have to learn from this is that the promise and decree which God has given out, that he will do us good, it should not hinder us to pray to him, but it should rather further us to it. Isaac had a promise of God that in his seed all the nations of the earth should be blessed. Now, seeing Isaac had this promise, he might be sure that he would he should have seed. And yet, when Rebekah was barren, that same promise made him pray to God to perform his promise, which he had made, and grant him seed. David had a promise of God that his house should be established, and he knew that it should be so. And yet, that same promise made him pray to God that he would establish his house. And Elijah, he knew well enough that the time of the drought was past, and therefore he prays to the Lord that he would send down rain upon the earth. And Daniel, he knew also that the time of captivity of the children of Israel in Babylon was worn out when the 70 years were expired, and upon this he prays to the Lord to deliver them. I, the children of God, know this to be true by experience, that their prayers are as prognostications, telling them beforehand, that such a thing shall be, as when there is appearance of a good year to come, then the people of the Lord are stirred up to pray for it. And this is a token to them that it is to come. And so when I see an appearance of a good work, 
that and this stirs me up to pray. This is this is it which moves the Lord to hold his hand still at the work. Objection if the Lord have resolved to do anything, whether I pray to him or not, he will work the work. Answer it is true, so he will. Yet it becometh us when we see the Lord working for us to go out and meet him. And if we and if he have ordained any good thing to be done to thee readily, he will stir thee up to cry to him for it. And so when either a whole kirk or a particular person are disposed to pray to God for a blessing, that is a foretelling of, of such a blessing to come upon them. And it is the blessing to come upon the work of reformation in hand to this land if all the people of the land were stirred up to pray to God as they have professed to be desirous of a reformation. Now, third point, the last point in the text is that the benefit that is promised to them who do so, and it is the peace of God. Which peace of God is so great a matter that it passes the mind, judgment, and understanding of all men to take it up. And where this peace is, it guardeth the heart and the mind from all invasions of enemies. And the way how we come into this peace is through Jesus Christ. First, then, it is peace that is promised. Peace, yes, peace. Peace is a thing that is sweet and amiable. When there is a natural peace among all the humors in the body, and one of them strives not against the other, then there is health in the body. And when there is domestic peace in a family between master and servants, husband and wife, parents and children, it is a sweet thing. When there is no disturbance at all among them, that family will thrive. And when there is civil peace in a kingdom, and it is not divided in itself, that is most comfortable. And it is the way for the, the uphold of a kingdom. But where there is division in a kingdom, it is the ready way to bring the destruction thereof. And the peace in the kirk, it is as comfortable a thing again as any of these. Howbeit indeed, this peace of the kirk, it is oft times mistaken as it has been among us. For there were none who cried faster for the peace of our kirk than those who were the very disturbers of our peace and was the cause of all our division in this kirk. And what was the peace they cried for? Nothing else but a peaceable possession of their lordly dignities and of their policies and making themselves great in the world to get a house established for themselves and for seed after them. And so for all in the kirk to go always in one way and so to have peace in it, that is not the best of it. Division is better to be in a church nor than for all to go on in a course of defection. It had been better there had been a division in the primitive kirk than that all should have been agreed peaceably together to the setting up of Antichrist, as they did. Except it was only some very few persons who showed themselves against it. And it is not so ill that there should be a rent and division in the land that, as that all of them should be go posting to perdition together. And so bring the curse of God upon them and their posterity which curse would undoubtedly have come upon this land if we had all of us peaceably received the service book and book of canons and practiced them throughout the land. And secondly, the peace of God. Why is it called the peace of God? Because this peace, it is of God. And this peace of God is the most excellent thing that can be. For there be none who can trouble them with whom the Lord is at peace. And if he be against any, so that he be not at peace with them, whether it be nation or congregation or particular person, how can they stand before him? Second, it is called the peace of God because it is he who is the author of this peace. It is he who gives it to these who have it. We may say that we shall have peace, but except the Lord grant it unto us, we shall not get it. And therefore we may not trust in man or in the arm of flesh to get peace by them, but we must only trust in God for it. And thirdly, it passes understanding. This peace, it passes the understanding of all natural men. The natural man, he knows nothing at all of this peace. Speak of peace to him and of faith, to it, who is the mother of this peace, and of joy, who is the companion of it. They are strange and uncouth language to him. 
He cannot conceive of that, nor think of it what it means. Yea, this peace, it passes the understanding of the, unregen- of the regenerate man and of the child of God, even after his new birth. He apprehends something of this peace and brings, it, uh, brings him to this to think what it is, but yet he cannot tell what it is for all that. Even as a man, when he is coming to the sea, and he will know by that which he sees that it is the sea, but he cannot see the whole sea from one side or from the other, one end to the other. And in this does it re- resemble God himself. For it may be seen that he is great, glorious, wise, and powerful, but there, can't, there is none can tell how much he has of every one of these. Even as it was with the Queen of Sheba, when she came to see Solomon, when she had once gotten a sight of him, it is said that she had no more heart in her. Her heart departed from her. She saw so great glory, so great wisdom, and all things that were in him so far beyond that which was reported of her to him, reported to her of him, or which she thought to have seen. Even so, when the child of God gets any measure of this peace, he cannot imagine what he has gotten of it. It is so far beyond his expectation, there is none who understands what this peace of God is. Not those who have it, and so they cannot express it. But they know well enough when they have this peace, even as it is in the health of the body. Ask any man what it is. He cannot tell you what it is or how great a benefit it is, but he knows well enough when he wants it, and he knows best what is the worth of it. Even so, it is with the peace of God in the soul. And then where this peace of God is, it guardeth the heart and the mind. It guardeth that part of a man which does understand everything. And it does also guard that part of a man which does affect and desire everything. There are a number of ills that are continually assaulting us. But whoever are possessed with this peace of God, it puts away all those enemies and makes us to overcome them. And all this is attained to through Jesus Christ. There is also a peace which cometh through the assurance of the remission of our sins. And this we get also through Jesus Christ. There is a peace also when all the powers of our soul agree together to serve God. And this we have also through Jesus Christ. And therefore we must first of all be partakers of Christ. And then we shall assuredly be partakers of this peace. And I would have you thinking that there is somewhat of this peace to be had even here in this life. And therefore seek after it and be never content with yourselves, neither be at rest until you get it. And that in some good measure. And albeit ye find not this peace begun this day into your souls, yet seek still after it through Christ and ye shall find it to come in and to take possession into your souls. Ye heard today of the shining of God's face. So there is a lifting up of God's countenance upon his own children. And ye should labor to understand what is the meaning of these things. If ye have eyes to see, ye will know when the sun shines and when it shines not. And ye will see a difference between the one time and the other. Even so, there is a difference between the estate of the soul when the face of God shines upon it and the estate thereof when the face of God shines not upon it. Psalm 25, it is said, The secret of the Lord is revealed to them that fear him. So the Lord revealeth secret things to his own, which the world knows not. And it is only through Christ that he reveals them to them the secret of their election or any other secret. Psalm 34, David says, Taste and see how gracious the Lord is. There, you see, the children of God get a taste of his goodness through Christ and in the canticles the spouse says to Christ let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth and in another place let him embrace me with his right arm etc think ye that these and such other things are spoken of and are not to be found no but all of them are sensible to the Christian soul they are not problems but realities Whatever thou findeth of these, see that it be through the testimony of God's Spirit, 
bearing witness to thy spirit, and that it cometh through Christ. And then thou shalt get that, hide, that hidden manna. It shall always spring up unto thee like a wholesome well to refresh thee, and not as a rotten pool to poison thee. Thou shalt get that white stone with that new name written on it, which no one knows but those who have it. And therefore, since... That this is the very thing that our Lord is holding out to us in this sacrament and is offering Christ unto us, though through whom we have them all. Let us go unto it, unto it now to get all these. Especially let us go to it that we may get this peace of conscience which passes understanding, that so our hearts and minds may be guarded thereby through Jesus Christ, to whom be honor and glory 